This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we're going to have long table number 176 uh, with John Janicek. Uh, John served with the New Jersey Department of Corrections actually for 25 years, earning his way up from officer, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and to correction major. Uh, when he retired, he was actually the most senior uniform staff in the entire department, which is pretty amazing. Numismatically, John is a member of the INS, of course, the New York Numismatic Club, the Trenton Coin Club, and the American Numismatic Association. He's an expert on the coinage of the German Empire of the 20th century. It was just, uh, just an 18-year period of, of uh, German Empire. Uh, this is, I believe, the second long table that you have given, John, uh, with another on the coinage of the free Hanseatic cities and their colonies of, uh, of the German Empire. Is also presented elsewhere on the thematic top topic of cats on coins. Uh, John's a regular viewer of these long tables, and you will often see a cat walk directly in front of his screen. Uh, perhaps we'll see that today when he's given today's long table number 176, the Royal Maundy Ceremony and Coins. John, take it away. All right, thank you, Jesse. I'd also like to thank the ANS for letting me give this talk today, and especially a shout out to David Hill in the library, who gave me a lot of help when I was doing my research. So thank you. And thank you for everybody who's tuned in today to hear me talk about the Royal Maundy Ceremony and Coins. And it's a very timely talk because next Thursday, six days from today, March 28th, um, the Maundy Ceremony will be held uh, at this beautiful and historic building, which is Worcester Cathedral in England. Uh, King Charles III presided last year, his first time uh, since his mother's death, yeah. but he's, uh, as we know, undergoing medical treatment, so he won't be presiding this year, but in his place, Her Majesty Queen Camilla will be uh, representing him. Um, and at this ceremony, uh, retired men and women from around the United Kingdom will receive uh, purses containing both regular circulating coins and coins that are specially struck for this ceremony. So I'll be talking about the ceremony, its history, and the coins today. All right, so what is Maundy? Simply, it's come to mean three different things. Uh, the first is command. Uh, the word command in Latin is mandatum. Uh, from which we obviously get uh, English terms like mandate, mandatory, things you have to do whether you want to or not. So at the Last Supper, Jesus gave his followers the command, uh, which is written in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So the first is the command. Second is a ceremony. Uh, it's been held in England for uh, over 800 years, um, with washing the feet of poor people, providing them with food, clothing, and money. Uh, over the years, the foot washing has dropped to the side, as has the gifts of uh, clothing and food, but today they still give out money. And the third aspect of Maundy, coins. Uh, silver coins in the domination of four, three, two, and one pence, which are distributed at the Maundy set. So going back in history, we start with the New Testament origins of this ceremony. Um, at the Last Supper, which is seen here in uh, Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, uh, Jesus gave his disciples the command that they love one another. And he also did something very important. He washed their feet. Now, this act of tremendous significance. Now, in Biblical times, as you imagine, people walked almost everywhere, bad roads, open fields. So it was very common when a visitor entered someone's house to have their feet washed. But their feet would be washed by a servant, certainly not by the owner of the house. So for Jesus, you know, uh, the leader of this group to humble himself and wash his uh, friend's feet, to act of tremendous uh, importance because he chose that he wanted them not just to love one another, but to show their love by acts of service, such as the washing of feet. And also, it should be noted next Thursday, 
to Maundy Thursday, the day of the British Maundy ceremony, Pope Francis himself is going to travel to a uh, Italian prison and wash the feet of prisoners. Um, again, humbling himself to show love as Jesus showed love at the Last Supper. Now, the history of the ceremony in England, we start with King John. Uh, well, there actually, there was services performed by clergy, not by the king, as far back as the fifth century. The first mention of a royal Maundy ceremony is 1210. King John, who's pictured there to the left, I guess most of us know as the villain from Robin Hood, or maybe something about the Magna Carta, but he held a service where he distributed food and clothing to the poor. Now, at that point, there was no foot washing yet. Now, 1213, uh, it's recorded that he gave 13 pennies to each of 13 poor men on the Thursday. The 13, of course, the significance of that is uh, the attendees of the Last Supper, the 12 apostles and Jesus. Uh, and the amount of the money that's been distributed over the last 800 plus years has changed. And also the number of attendees who received the money. Uh, it's never been less than 12 of both pence and people uh, sometimes it's 13. It's also been the age of the ruler, which is what it is now, uh, or the years that they were on the throne. So again, over 800 years, a lot of things have changed, but other things have remained the same. And uh, to the right are examples of the food and uh, that would have been given out, salted fish, which was non-perishable or kept for a long time, bread, the obviously the common food of everyone back then, and wine, or sometimes ale, but originally it was wine. So then we go fast forward to 1326, where we see the first instance of the royal foot washing. Uh, Edward III, seen on the left here, uh, not a very popular king, uh, but still his, in 1326, he held a ceremony in which, in addition to distributing food and clothing and money, he washed the feet of the poor, sewn on the right side. Um, and at this time, uh, the ceremony was could be held wherever, the, just wherever the king chose to be on Maundy Thursday, it was usually in London, but if he was traveling around the country, it could easily have been somewhere else also. Uh, next, we go to 1698, um, William III, seen on the left, was the last monarch to actually perform foot washing at the Maundy Sarah. Um, and actually he was the last sovereign in a long time to even participate in the ceremony. Uh, the sovereign did not participate from 1699 until 1932. Um, so that was mostly the reigns of the the Hanoverians, Victoria. Um, so they chose not to uh, go to the ceremony. In their place, the Lord High Almoner, who's the official we see in the middle of the uh, image on the right, uh, he presided. Uh, Lord High Almoner was in charge of all of the uh, monarch's charitable activities. And so he would preside, he would give the money or, and oversee the um, giving out of the food and the clothing, uh, along with his assistant, the sub -almoner. And now by the time of George I, uh, the number of individuals receiving the monarch's charity was settled at one man and one woman for each year of his age, uh, receiving food in the form of bread, salt fish, beef, and wine or ale. Uh, they also received clothing, usually in the form of a pair of shoes, pair of stockings and cloth from which to make clothing. And they also received one penny for each year of the monarch's age. Over time, the gifts of food and clothing were changed to money. Um, obviously, it's a lot easier to distribute money than perishable food and bolts of cloth. Uh, so they changed the women received uh, 35 shillings in lieu of the clothing starting in 1724. Uh, all of the attendees received 30 shillings in lieu of the food in, after 1837. And the men received 45 shillings for clothing 
Uh, it's since been equal, so the men and the women receive the same amount now. Uh, 1883 is when the men stopped receiving. Okay. Now, locations. Uh, the uh, Mondi ceremony is held at different. Uh, 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 it was originally held from 1714 to 1890 at the Chapel Royal in Whitehall. After that, uh, at Westminster Abbey, which is shown on the right. But during Queen Elizabeth's the second reign, she made the conscious decision to hold the ceremony all around the country. Eventually, every Anglican cathedral in England hosted the Maundy ceremony, as well as one in Wales, uh, St. David's Cathedral, and one in Northern Ireland, St. Patrick's uh, in Armagh, well, an Anglican cathedral, not a Catholic. Now I have to backtrack one slide. Return of the monarch. Um, in 1932, uh, King George V was on the throne. His cousin, Princess Marie Louise, who, uh, was, who attended the Maundy service every year religiously, uh, convinced him that it would be wise if he attended as a way of bonding with his people and uh, reviving an ancient tradition. Uh, he didn't perform any foot washing, but he did uh, attend the ceremony and hand out the purses to the uh, recipients. Um, in the middle is uh, Edward VIII. Uh, he uh, presided over the ceremony in 1936, um, but he didn't, the coins he gave out did not have his image because the royal mint didn't have time to strike coins in his image. In fact, coins bearing his image are very rare. They're just patterns. Uh, and then he abdicated. His brother, George VI, uh, he attended the service in 1940 and 1944. It's a couple of years. Now, uh, Elizabeth II became queen in 1952. She regarded the Maundy ceremony as one of the most important highlights of the year. Uh, and during her extremely long reign, which ended quite recently, she attended all but five of the Maundy services. Um, two of them took place soon after she had given birth to one of her children, so she uh, didn't attend those. Uh, two times she was visiting other Commonwealth countries. And in 2022, uh, she was quite ill and uh, her terminal illness, and her son, then Prince Charles, uh, attended in her place. Uh, it should also be noted, of course, during COVID in 2020 and 2021, the ceremony was held privately, and at least they still held it, but it was just held privately without the attendees, and then the uh, coins were mailed to the people who would have been attending if it hadn't been for COVID. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, King Charles will not attend this year's ceremony, which he did preside over last year, but his wife, Queen Camilla, will be now ahead. So the gifts. So I mentioned before, it's changed over the years from food, clothing, uh, one penny for each year, all that kind of thing. But now with the, each attendee receives a red leather purse shown here, containing five pounds and 50 pence in regular circulating coins. And in fact, this year it will be a five pound uh, circulating commemorative coin honoring Charles' 75th birthday, as well as a uh, regular Royal Mint 50 cent piece, a 50 pence piece. And again, that would be in the red leather purse. Uh, in the white leather purse shown on the left, a Maundy coin is equal to the monarch's eight. Uh, since uh, a Maundy set being four, three, two, one pence, each set is easily enough 10 pence. So since Charles is 75 this year, each person will receive seven of the sets and also five pence, most likely in the form of a three and a two pence. Uh, the purses are made by Barrow, Hepburn, and Gale. Uh, which is apparently a very uh, luxurious British leather making firm uh, of high regard. Uh, and the pensioners who receive these gifts, uh, they are nominated by their local clergy. Uh, they're all 
elderly people um, who have distinguished themselves through their charitable works, service to the community, service to the church. Um, so it's a, considered a great honor to be a, a recipient of the Mondi uh, money. At one point, uh, people would come back every year for the uh, service, but now it's changed. You receive it once and, and that's it. So the ceremony today is a Church of England service. Um, the church or cathedral where it is held becomes a chapel royal for the day, which it just means a place of worship attended by the monarch. Uh, again, the recipients are one man and one woman for each year of the monarch's age. So that'll be 75 men and 75 women. Um, the recipients and certain honored guests are waiting in the church when the royal procession comes in. And this is, uh, would be part of the royal procession. Uh, so the, the monarch or the representative, the Lord High Almoner, who is a, usually a high ranking churchman, uh, the bishop of the diocese, the clergy of the diocese, various royal official, four children who have been part of the ceremony for years and years, obviously different children every year. And they are escorted by uniformed yeomen of the guard. And these gentlemen we see here are the yeomen of the guards. They're not strictly speaking the beef feeders who are the yeoman warders of the Tower of London, but they're a similar organization. All of uh, men who served in the British Armed Forces, you can see on their chests, some pretty impressive array of medals. Um, so they're all retired uh, non-commissioned officers or warrant officers of the British Armed Forces. And you see the gentlemen here are carrying in um, trays holding the purses. There are six uh, silver trays on which the uh, Mondi purses are carried in uh, before they are distributed. Okay, the ceremony itself uh, it's a relatively brief. Service. There are two Bible readings, including uh, John thirteen thirty four, the uh, which establishes the mandatum, um, the chapel royal, and the cathedral's own choir sing together. Um, then the monarch will go around and give out the um, or the representative uh, give out the purses to the half of the people. Then there'll be another song. Then they go and give about the other half of the people and the uh, yeoman of the guard carry the uh, trays with the purses. And you can see here, here's a Prince Charles or uh, King Charles, excuse me, uh, giving out the purse and greeting each person individually. The, the gentleman behind him is the Lord High Almoner who is a bishop. Um, and then the, um, after that, the entourage processes out of the church. It's, and again, it's a relatively brief ceremony. Uh, but obviously one of great historical significance. Speaking of the historical significance of the ceremony, uh, there are two vestiges of the past that we can see here in this picture. This is the picture from the 2015 Mondi ceremony held at Windsor. See that the uh, Queen Elizabeth was still alive then. She's there as was the Prince Philip standing next to her. Um, so there's two vestiges of when the monarch did actually wash people's feet. The one is the towels. You can see the four children standing there. They have linen towels draped around them. And certain of the other participants also uh, have towels uh, as part of their uh, costumes. Uh, these towels actually have been in use since 1883. The same towels, which are just carefully preserved and kept only for the Mondi service. And they, of course, represent when the feet were actually washed at the service. Uh, the towels were used to uh, wash and dry the people's feet. Now, it should be noted, the individual whose feet were being washed was supposed to uh, wash their own feet first. Then a royal servant would come around and wash everyone's feet. So by the time the monarch got there, the feet were supposed to be relatively clean, but you can imagine the feet of a medieval poor person probably be pretty bad even after two or three washings. So that's where these bouquets, which you can see the queen and the children 
and pretty much everybody in the picture carrying. They're called nose gigs. Uh, when the smell of the feet got too much for you, you would sniff the uh, lovely fragrant flowers to uh, refresh yourself. Uh, nose gays are made by a lady who is an expert at the uh, doing this. She receives a Mondi set as her payment, actually. Uh, the flowers are narcissists, cupressus, daffodils, rosemary, thyme, violets, and white stocks. Um, so a very nice smelling flowers that, uh, again, now they're just a, a historical reminder of the old days, but it used, they used to have a practical function. Um, and also, as I mentioned, uh, the lady who makes the nosegays gets a payment in Mondi coins. Also, the children that attend each get a Mondi set, and most of the officials also get a Mondi set as, as their official payment for their, their services. So moving on, so that's the ceremony. Now we'll talk about the coins. Now, originally, for, for much of the 800 plus year history of the Mondi services, the coins distributed were regular coins in the round. Um, I mentioned that King John was the uh, first monarch to hold a Mondi service. So the coin on the left is one of his pennies. Um, coin on the right is a penny of Charles the first who uh, held, he didn't usually attend the service, but coins given out at the service would have been these pennies uh, to bear his image. And of course, Charles I uh, came to an untimely end, being overthrown and executed uh, during the uh, Commonwealth period when Oliver Cromwell was in charge. There was no Mondi service and no foot washing. They were deemed to be frivolous things. But, uh, so that takes us to 1660. So when Charles II took the throne, uh, after the death of Oliver Cromwell and the uh, collapse of the Commonwealth, he had made very strong effort to reestablish his power and prestige. As you know, the English people had had a period without kings and his return to power, he really wanted to cement his importance, his prestige, one of a better term, his majesty. So he um, revived the Mondi service and um, he participated in it personally, including the foot washing. And the coins that would have been distributed, they were regular circulating. We tend to think today, the four, three, two, and one Mondi set. Um, back then, chances are the money would have just been pennies that they gave out. But still, for each of the monarch, I have a picture of a Mondi set because they are quite attractive. Uh, but you notice in the reverse of Charles's coins on the left, um, rather than numbers or letters, C's. So his monogram, C for Charles, of course. Um, so one C for one penny, two C's for two, three, and four. Um, and it, the coins are otherwise familiar design. Uh, the monarch's image on the obverse with his titles. We can see Carolus to de Gratia, uh, Mag, Rit, Franz, et Hibernia, Rex. So by Charles II, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. Uh, just back then, they didn't realize the French had their own king. It's a vestige of the Hundred Years' War and all that. Uh, so, but when Charles passed away, his brother James took the throne in 1685. So we look at the reverse of the coins of James to the right, and we see what, what, what are Roman numerals. But in fact, they are letter I's because um, uh, Latin really doesn't have the letter J. They have the letter I instead. So if you see the obverse of James's coins here, his name, which in Latin is Jacobus, is actually it's spelled with an I. Uh, so that the um, what we appear to be numerals on the back of the 
of his one, two, three, and four pence coins are actually his monogram also. And just the same as with Charles. All right, so James II was deposed in 1688. William and Mary came to the throne as co-monarchs. Now, it would have been pretty messy to have a whole bunch of W's and M's on the reverse of uh, coins, some of which, especially in the case of the penny, is a little tiny thing. So this is where we see what we still have today, the crowned Arabic numeral, one, two, three, and four. So, and I'm going to skip through some of these a little bit on the quick side because it's, they're pretty standard. You have the monarch or monarchs on the obverse and the crown denomination on the reverse. Uh, again, with the titles continue. So William and Mary, Anne, George the I I couldn't get a good picture of an obverse and reverse. So this is just the obverses, but um, you need to get the idea. Uh, George the second, same thing with the uh, crowned numeral and the king. George III, there were a couple changes in the coinage because he ruled for quite a long time, but I just represented it with one set here. Um, George IV, now you see on George IV, they condensed his titles so that they're all on the obverse. And so the reverse, where formerly part of his titles would be, was replaced with a wreath. So we have what is really what we have today, a monarch on the obverse and the uh, Numeral on the reverse, the crown above it, the date on either side, and the wreath. And see that George the Fourth, see it in the two larger points. So rather than being uh, spelled the way we uh, do the Roman four these days, the I and the V, actually they just had four I's to stay. At the, birth of the period. And the same thing with William the Fourth. In fact, the three pence here, you can see very clearly the four I's rather than the um, uh, I and the V. Now, um, uh, jumping ahead here. So on the right, we have Victoria. Uh, again, four, three, two, and one. Now, Victoria, as we know, for a very long time. So we have three different. Um, well, two changes, three different designs. So this is Victoria Younghead. Uh, these were on her Mondi coins from 1838 to 1887. This was in, this is an 1875 set, so middle of that period. Uh, then in 1887 for circulating coins and 1888 for the Mondi coins, uh, they changed the design to, to what is called her Jubilee. Uh, portrait because it was her golden jubilee 50 years on the throne uh, which you can see there with the small crown perched on top of her head and then in 1893 a final change to the veiled head which you see on the right of uh, the queen with a, wearing a crown and with a veil over her head and that was her last um, Mondi coins which were 1893 to 1901. Hey, and of course, when Victoria died, uh, Edward VII took the throne. His Mondi coins uh, were first struck in 1902. Um, here we have an example of his Mondi set. This is a 1910 set. Um, and he died, of course. George V took the throne in 1911. And we see here a 1911 Mondi set of George V. Um, now, 1920, now, of course, these coins the whole time had been struck to the sterling standard, 0.9255. Now, 1920, because of the incredible expense of World War I, which almost bankrupted the nation, uh, they won the war, but it just cost so much money, they had to debase the coinage from the sterling standard of 925 down to 500 bonds. And that did include the Mondi coinage. And some of the coins from that period um, show rather unpleasant tarnish due to the lower silver content. Okay, so that's George V. Now, George, as we know, he passed away and his son took the throne as Edward VIII. However, 
since he ruled for such a brief period of time, the royal mint did not strike any Maundy sets for him. So um, starting 1937, uh, George VI, uh, seen here on the left, this is one of his Maundy sets, and they were um, struck in 500 fineness until 1947. But this 1949 set was returned to the sterling standard. Because when they reduced or eliminated silver in the circulating coinage, it was felt that it was unworthy and appropriate for a personal gift from the King of England to be struck in base metal. So they uh, mint in a, you know, pretty strange to put more silver in coins, but they did return to the 925, which is a, a very nice nod to tradition, I think. Okay. Um, so on the right, we have the uh, Mondi set of Elizabeth II. Uh, this is an early set, 1953, but uh, they kept the same uh, portrait for Elizabeth II, despite the great length of her reign, uh, I really don't know why, just a tradition. They didn't see the need to change it. It's, it's a lovely portrait. But so all of her coins, Amondi coins, till her death, they kept the same portrait. Now here's something special. Uh, I really like these. Um, uh, just as when Victoria had her golden jubilee, they changed the... Uh, image on her coins uh, to celebrate Elizabeth II's gold, golden jubilee, uh, the Royal Mint struck a proof set in gold for sale to collectors, of course. So the 2002 proof set uh, struck in gold included a Mondi set. So here we have the four, three, two, and one Pence coins of the uh, 2002 gold proof set in gold. I, I, these are just I really like these coins. Very, uh, a very special a tribute to uh, Elizabeth II. And now it takes us to uh, Charles III. Um, so this is a 2023 Mondi set, um, at which Charles III would have personally distributed last year. Um, the last year's Maundy service was held on April 6th at York Minster, a, a very, very old historic uh, cathedral in Great Britain. Um, and the sets that will be distributed next week by Queen Camilla will look the same as these, the only difference being they will be dated 2024. And that takes me to the end. Um, we see here the Royal Coat of Arms of Great Britain. Uh, as you see, it features two lions, one to the left and one on top of the crown. That's my obligatory cat reference that I have to work into every one of my talks because I love cats. Um, so thank you for watching my presentation and uh, I'm certainly uh, open for any questions or comments that anyone uh, might have. Thank you, John, for that. Uh... I'll excellent. stop sharing my screen now. There you go. Um, if there's anyone who has any questions, you're more than welcome to unmute and simply ask them. Uh, if you'd like me to ask for you, you're more than welcome to type it into the chat and I'll ask away. Um, Mary Lannon has a question. Uh, how do you obtain these in, in the open market? That's a good question. Well, the people who receive them, um, very often sell them. Um, uh, it, I think it's pretty customary to keep one set as a souvenir. Like, for instance, when, uh, so we would receive during the last year of Queen Elizabeth's reign, nine Mondi sets, uh, seven this year because of Charles being 75, so seven full sets. Certainly makes sense to keep one and sell the rest for um, pocket money or you could certainly give them away if you like. Uh, so that's how they enter the open market for the most part. People who receive them sell them. And I said, some of the people who uh, uh, have connections to the service also um, receive coins. And again, if they're not a collector, they have no real interest, interest they sell them. Uh, you can get them. Uh, 
seems like a random way to sell them. Yeah, it is. Uh, but uh, as far as collecting them, um, you go to any major show, uh, New York International, uh, people who specialize in English coins, uh, I've seen literally dozens of Mondi sets in somebody's case. Um, uh, you can buy them from dealers. Uh, certainly major internet auction sites who will remain nameless are a good way to find them. I just go there and punch in Mondi set and uh, uh, be quite a few of them. And also sold singly. I have a question. Did they just mint the number that was needed for the gifts uh, for the ceremony or did they mint extra? Um, there's always some extra. At one point, they minted, they struck thousands more than they needed. And so you could buy them from the Royal Mint, actually. But that got tightened up, I believe, during the reign of Edward VII. They cut back, or no, uh, Edward the, yeah, there was Ed, during the reign of Edward VII, they cut back a lot on the numbers that are struck. And uh, you really don't, uh, you, can't, you can't buy them directly from the Royal Mint anymore. Uh, Mary Lynn wants to know if there are a dedicated subset of Mondi collectors. Uh, she only knows you and one other person who collect them. Um, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't really consider. I don't really collect them anymore. I have some, but uh, since I changed my interest to 20th century German Empire, I haven't acquired any. But um, they they're not cheap. Um, you know, people out there really like them. Are there any groups uh, dedicated to it or even like online? That I'm not aware of. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't um, be surprised I, if there's an online group or something like that. Uh, I, talk I have about. one right here, in fact. There you in go. A, uh, vintage box. This is 1907 Mondi set. You're a young man back then, John. <laughs> uh, I have a question. I may have missed it, but how are recipients chosen? And has that process changed over the century? Centuries. Oh. Well, thank you for saying great talk, Al. Um, originally, it was poor people resident in the area where the service was held, so usually in London. And for years, the same people would come. They would just add one person each year. Like, say, if the king was 56, they'd have 56 people. Because of the age of the people, probably a few would die. So maybe they would have to pick six more plus one more for the king being a year older as they added on. Um, so originally it was just so, and it was uh, poor people, but they tried to pick people who had been um, more prosperous, but had fallen on hard times and, and to, to kind of a, a reward for their hard work throughout their lives. Uh, currently it's uh, people that are nominated uh, by the local Church of England clergy to uh, who have uh, a lot of service to the church, to their community, to charity. Um, again, it's considered a, a great honor to uh, be selected. Uh, I'm going to throw a question in there. When did the uh, custom of giving away as many, or, uh, as, as much as the king or queen uh, their age start like you know you said 75 pence this year so when uh for his age when did that start um let me look back in my notes i'm pretty sure i have that there uh, it's the time of uh, george the first okay so and i said originally they were most we think of mondi sets as four three two and one but originally that was just pennies the, the, the one pence coin yeah, that's actually the next question. Why why yeah. the denominations of four, three, two, and one? Um, well, it's just logical because that's 10. You add them up. So for every uh, 10 years of the, the monarch's life, you get a set and then uh, an, uh, a few odd coins to make up the difference. So that's basic. Yeah. And also it's tradition. Uh, the English love their traditions and it's just something they've been doing for so long that... Uh, no reason to change. Next. Uh, uh, are the coins still presented in a poke at the Mondi ceremony? By poke, I mean, I'm assuming you mean purse? Um, yes. They, they still receive the coins in the two purses, the uh, uh, 
uh, red and the white. Uh, Jim McClellan, does anyone collect the purses? That's a great question. I don't know. That would be uh, a, a subset of a subset, right? A subset <laughs> of a subset. Well, I imagine there are people, I, I imagine, but I don't know for a fact. Uh, one could go to a major internet auction site and type in Mondi purse and see what comes up. It's quite possibly right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Al, with a question, does anyone uh, or does a complete set of issues exist, perhaps in the British Museum or elsewhere? That I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Very possibly. Respect, yeah, maybe for the, the more recent uh, century or more, but but maybe some of the earlier issues. Chuck, you yeah, have your quite, hand raised? Yeah, uh, quick question. Oh, first of all, John, that was terrific. Really enjoyed that. And Thank I you. might mention that I was at a coin show up in Charleston, South Carolina, about two years ago, and uh, there was a gentleman that had one from every uh, uh, ruler. Of course, I didn't know if that was accurate. I, I, I didn't know who started the tradition. And I, I believe the set was somewhere in the twenty-five dollars or $35,000 range. Oh, I'm sure. And, and I, was, I was really tempted. But I knew that my wife would chop my head off <laughs> when I would bring that in. And I just decided, all right, I'm joking, of course. It, I, I wasn't really very tempted, but it was astounding. My question, though, is this. Are there some particular um, rulers that are almost impossible to obtain? Uh, are they very rare ones? Do you know of that? No, they're all probably certain years. I, I haven't. I haven't done that much research to know which years, but I think you could get every ruler. Uh, like say, uh, William IV didn't rule for very long as mm -hmm. opposed to Victoria who ruled for years and years. So right. Victoria sets are very easy to find. I would say something like uh, William IV would be a lot harder to find and again, just because the uh, much shorter duration of his reign. Sure. And so like for instance, uh, Edward VIII, there are no Maundy sets because he ruled for such a short period of time and went, you know, there are a few pattern coins of other denominations, but to my knowledge, they didn't strike any. So even in his one Maundy service, he gave out coins that were struck for his, with his father's image. Yeah. Well, thanks, John. And very, very okay. interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have another question. Are they still produced out of silver? Uh, how are the diameters of the coins determined if not based on that many pence worth of silver? Yes, they are. Like I said, since 1947, they have been returned to the sterling standard, 0.925 fine. Um, so yeah, they were, they're based on the diameter of what a silver penny would have been or, or two or three or four penny at the time that it kind of crystallized so about the reign of George the first. When I said I have here a set, probably hard to see. Um, the, the penny is quite tiny. Um, and the two pence is a little bit bigger and the three and four. Um, and one thing you'll find, I probably should have mentioned this in my talk, is sets without a three pence or a thripney bit, uh, but containing the other three coins for the simple reason that they were spent uh, from the uh, relatively early 18th uh, 19th century, uh, there were no circulating one, two, or four pence uh, silver pieces in Great Britain for the most part. But the three pence was a common denomination. So a lot of people, or maybe their children or grandchildren, uh, took the three pence coins, perhaps to buy candy or something, and, and spent them. Uh, I have a, I think I have a George the Sixth set that has the uh, four, two, and one penny coins pristine and the three pence worn. I don't know if that's the original three pence or somebody just put one in there to, to complete the set, but um, so you'll, you'll find that. And, and honestly, once it enters circulation, it loses any extra value as a Maundy coin. It, it'd be indistinguishable from any other uh, three pence. Yeah, these are listed in the Krause catalog of world coins. And it, it does give mintages, which are cool to look at because they usually hover around a thousand pieces or just above that 
Uh, yeah. so they, they are, you know, relatively low mintage coins, as you noted. Um, but since they're, you know, presentation pieces, they're, they're kept sometimes for centuries in, in a complete set, which is pretty cool. Well, it looks like something popped up there, Jason. Uh, on eBay, I see a, a few Mondi coin sets in small boxes, uh, like a large ring box with, quote unquote, the Royal Mint stamped on the inside upper lid and Mondi money stamped on the outside lid. Yeah, that's the one I have here, which I'll hold up. Uh, as the uh, Royal Arms, and it says Mondi money on the lid. Would that have been inside the purse? No. Uh, they were used to be in cardboard. Now they're in the, let me go back. I don't think I can go back. Uh, they're just in the two by two coin flips, the uh, clear plastic flips, because it'd be impractical because the purses aren't that big. You couldn't fit seven of these in the mm -hmm. purse very well. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're just in flips. But the people who receive uh, sets as uh, compensation, like the children, the lady who makes the nose gaze, things like that, they'll come in a box. Uh, I think they're, they're square these days. Um, and they'll say Royal Mint, Mondi Money on them. That, that, that's for somebody who only gets one or two sets as a payment. Uh, they said they really wouldn't, a box this big wouldn't fit in the person very well. So not everyone gets the, well, this year we'll get the 75 pence then, like the children will just get one single set? Yeah, one or two sets. Yeah, there's the Lord High Almoner, great title. Uh, he, he gets a set or two. Um, and it used to be a policy where Royal Mint employees could buy a set I believe every five years, uh, but uh, they actually had to sign a piece of paper saying that you weren't going to sell it. Mm. I don't know if that was honored more in the breach or not, but they did away with that. Interesting. John, um, yes. if you're talking about the woman that uh, is hired to make the nose gaze and that she was given Mondi money. Was she only paid her whole bill in Mondi money, or was she written a check and like, you know, here's two two sets of Mondi money? Uh, my research indicates she just gets Mondi money. Wow. She's a, she's a source for collectors then. <laughs> she is, absolutely. But yeah, so what I understand, it's very common for people to keep one set and just sell the rest. Uh, we have a uh, question. Are they business strikes or proofs? Um. I guess probably the best way to describe them would be specimen. They don't receive the full proof treatment with the polished planchets and the double or more striking of that a uh, fully fledged proof coin would, but they definitely are treated better than a, a you know a penny or five pence coin for circulation. So a specimen would be the best way to describe. Uh, and also, uh, something I should have mentioned during my talk, um, certain years, the Royal Mint proof sets, in addition to the Mondi sets that are given away, the proof sets had Mondi sets included, it's like the 1911 a proof set, which was the first year of uh, George V's coinage, contains uh, a Mondi set. Now, that is actual proof, but they're separate. That was they were made as proofs for sale to collectors, separate from the Mondi coins. And the 1902 um, Edward VII matte proof set actually contains the Mondi set in matte proof. I have that, those coins, and they're uh, quite attractive. But I've heard that the Royal Mint employees uh, didn't like the fact that the matte proof coins were dull so some of them tried to polish them on their leather aprons but that didn't work out too well uh no more questions in the chat we have a couple more minutes if anyone wants to enter any or unmute yourself and ask 
Uh, looks like that. That's, uh, thank you again, John, for uh, an excellent talk and uh, well received and well timed as well with the ceremony and just six days. Days. Now, I, I haven't looked personally, but I imagine there's probably uh, links out there to see the ceremony. Yeah. Uh, I, think yeah. I might do that. I'm sure it'd be quite fascinating. Excellent. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh,